Welcome to the Bible Truth of Our Hymns. We're going to look at a hymn from a hymnal and check it to see if that hymn is biblically sound or not. There are stanzas in the hymns or words that are not correct from the Bible. We need to see that in a church where there are three types of people. Number one, they're saved and serving and loving the Lord. Number two, they're saved and they're worldly. And number three, lastly, they're lost men. Jesus said, every idle word shall man give an account. Are we proposing men and women in the church to sin by the hymns that are chosen? We will examine some, but not all, in this study. We will set a groundwork that the sin, that the sin, the hymn that we missed, you can be able to check for yourself and study yourself to see, is this hymn that I like correct? Now, not all the hymns that we're going to look at will be wrong. Many will be great and wonderful hymns. And a few will have to be, is it really proper? Will it glorify God or will it cause a man to sin? Okay, let's look at the biblical truth of our hymns. Today, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with this one. Charles Wesley. It's a beautiful hymn. It's beautiful to sing. And what I'll do is we'll make notes on this first and then we'll get into the hymn. One year after his experience of getting saved, Wesley was taken with the urge to write another hymn. This one in a common commemoration of his renewal of faith. The hymn took the form of 18 stanza poems. Begin with the open lines God to glory to God and praise and love. Be ever and ever given was published in 1740 and entitled The Anniversary Day of One's Conversion. What a wonderful. This is the foundation all for a thousand tongues to sing. This is Wesley a year after he's got saved, a newborn babe in Christ growing. Look what he does. The seventh verse which begins all for a thousand tongues to sing and which now is the first verse of the shorter hymn. Recall Bowler's words. I have a thousand tongues. I would praise him with them all. The hymn was placed first in John Wesley's collection of hymns for the people called Methodists, published in 1780. It appeared in every Methodist hymnal, the Wesleyan, from the time unto publication of hymns and songs in 1983. Nothing wrong with this one. It's a wonderful hymn. But we got to look at some things. We've got to look at a church building. And I'm talking building. I'm going to talk about building right now. I'm not talking about churches built as people. Where it has a congregation of mixed people. Inside a church building, there are the church. Saved Christians washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet inside the church building. There are also lost people who are not part of the, the congregation. They're not part of the church. They're not part of the bride. And the Lord would rapture those that are the church would be raptured up. And those who are not going to be left behind. So. I'm going to take a wonderful, great hymn that should be put on the lips of all born-again, Bible-believing Christians that are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But for a moment, let's step aside and let's look at the church building that's saved with lost and has saved people. And then the third category that we've, we've started with this study, the worldly Christian, they're saved, but that's it. They're saved. There's no other point in their lives, but they're saved. So, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. 
Now, you would run right off with a charismatic moan, whatever kind of junk they do. Thousand worldly tongues of Hebrew, of English, of Japanese, of Chinese, of English, of French, of Mexican, of Spanish, of Italian, dialects. Tongues is not Jabin Joan of the lips. It's a language of the people that came off from Babel in Genesis. My great Redeemer's praise. Capital R. We are redeemed by Jesus Christ. And whatever tongue you are that you're saved, whether you're in the darkest jungles of uh, Africa or you are in the brightest city of New York or Chicago. Whatever your dialect is of salvation, praise God in your language. The glories of my God and King, capital K. Not for the church. <laughs> See, Jesus is not king unto his second advent when he's crowned. And then he's king of the Jews. He is our husband. He is our redeemer. He is our word. He is our life. He's never king. It sounds good. And a lot of these hymns, they'll use the word king, because king can rhyme with sing and, and every other word that can ring and ding a ling. If it rhymes with king, we can use it. But rhyming is not scriptural. And that's not the point here, but he's not our king. But when he sits king of the Jews, the triumph of his grace. My gracious master, capital M. That's what they call Jesus throughout the, the Gospels. Master, Master, and my God. All right. Is Jesus Christ the master of someone who sits and sings this hymn that are worldly and have nothing to do with what God tells them to do after salvation? Church, get up. We're going to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Page 437. Everyone get up and sing. Everyone. And that worldly Christian gets up and lying to my gracious master. You just made him lie. And yet, then again, there were people in the Bible who called him master and didn't believe it either. And they would be found liars. That rich, wrong, young ruler that came to Jesus. Master, master, what must I do? You walked away from Jesus and did nothing. And my God. Someone has been invited to the church, or they think church is something good to get them to heaven by God liking them being in church, and they get up and say, and my God. They're not saved, they're not washing the blood. Are they, uh, See now? I am not invalidating this hymn. It should be a wonderful hymn for Christians to sing, but let's look at the congregation of the church that's inside the walls of the church building, who are saved, lost, and they're saved, and they don't care anything about God. And we get up to have us all sing. Let's all sing to God. Let's all do wonderful things. And then they're singing lies. You're making them lie by some of these hymns. I think the song leaders should get up there and say, okay, we're going to sing this hymn. And I think, you know what? All those who do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, do not sing this hymn. Just follow along and get the words in the heart. Those who are in this congregation are, are saved and you don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. You're not doing right and you're worldly and you know it. You need just to pay attention to the words. Don't sing. As me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad. See, to spread the, through the earth abroad. Assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad. Okay, now that that's the worldly Christian he's left out. What is to, to spread the word to have the assistance of God is going in all the world and preach the gospel. That is something that is not being done by the worldly Christian. There are many a times when I sit at, my, sit at my booth with my family at the flea market, there are people who come up to us and talk, and we just praise the Lord God because we're happy to be saved. We're happy to, to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. There are others who come up, well, that's the nice thing you're doing, but... Uh, 
And you can't get anywhere praising God on that because you're trying to encourage them and they don't want to do nothing. The honors of thy name. Okay. Jesus. Oh, right. You know how hard it is to find a hymn? We are up to 49 hymns in this hymn that I have. And I think we've done eight or nine of them that are on this video because we're not going to do them all. And I'm sitting down, I'm going to think, I'm, I'm going to, this hymn note here has, that's over 560, plus 580, 81 more. I think I'm going to look at the individual hymns and just see how, if I can find Jesus and give you the percentage. Not not how many times you find Jesus in the, in the hymn, but how many hymns actually have the name Lord Jesus? This one has Jesus. Charles Wesley's not ashamed. Only the name of Jesus that we just read at the end of stanza two. But he's not ashamed to put J-E-S-U-S. -S. Some of these hymns, I don't know. If Jesus is so great as he is, why can't you name him? Jesus, the name that charms our fears. God has not given us the, the spirit of fear but the spirit of victory that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear. The lost man? Is it really? Do they really walk out of that congregation? Some do. Some do get right, but most of them, many of them. Tis life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So what we're finding here, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel, the life. What we are finding here is scriptural doctrine, references from the Bible taken into this hymn. Health and peace. What's the greatest health we're going to get? We're going to get a new body has no sorrow, no pain, no misery, no sin. Perfect peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. Amen. Back Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he got saved and he was baptized. Baptized second. Saved first. Ethiopian eunuch. So let's set forth a scriptural minded hymn. That is proper for the lips and the heart of one that is saved and serving and doing right. Those who are not saved sit in the congregation. And just my, you know, what was Charlie Brown's teacher? Why, 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 why? You think God appreciates a lost man singing this wonderful, great scriptural hymn about Jesus Christ without the heart? Without the heart, there's no salvation. His blood can make the vilest sinner. His blood can make the vilest sinner. Vile. Let me try this again. Sorry. His blood can make the foulest clean. Got the two lines there mixed up. And there have been people. I have told into my ears. Oh, God can never save me. There have been many stories I've listened to, soul winners. People you would think you would look at, they're not, what could, what possibly could they ever have done so bad that Jesus can't save them? And yet this hymn sings out. No matter what the wickedest, most vile sin ever there is on this planet Earth from the time of Adam to the second advent of Jesus Christ. God is able to save your soul. His blood availed for me. Now, it would be good for a lost man in church not to break out and sing what he doesn't know and to say, listen, watch. Watch, listen. Imagine a lost man just reading this. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the power the prisoner free. 
His blood can make the fowls. I messed that up again. His blood makes the fowls clean. His blood availeth for me. Now, if he's got the attitude, he's, he's got to sing this hymn because everybody else is singing it. And that's not going to go through his ears. But if he just reads along while the congregation, and then the congregation, if they're truly right to the Lord, they're going to break out in heavenly song as he reads. Aren't we supposed to be a witness to the lost? Are we not supposed to give them a, a, a hope that they're saved and they're not? Can we send a sinner home from church after singing hymns? Like, oh, that must be me because I sang it. We got to be careful. That's one of the, like, the one dangerous things which I don't do it here to say this prayer. He speaks and listening to his voice. And I'm really slow because it's hard to follow with seven stanzas. This is it. He speaks and listening to his voice. New life, the death, the dead receive. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was dying, going to hell. You know what Jesus done to me? If I were to die right now, if I were to my body take its final breath, its last heartbeat, brain don't do nothing anymore before the rapture, I will not die. I will be absent from the body. The body will die, absent from the body, and I'll be present with the Lord. Everlasting, eternal life. I have the Son. I have life. Not for a lost man. A lost man dies, he's buried, and he wakes up in hell. The mournful broken hearts rejoice the humble poor will believe. First Thessalonians chapter 4 about the rapture. Weep as not as others weep when it comes to a death of a loved one. But, you know, you miss them. Your heart is broken. There's an empty part in your life. I've been through that. I have witnessed death. I had a wife that died. I've got a son. He's not dead, but he's in a place where I cannot see him for a long period of time. If I can see him, I'm not going to give you more. It wouldn't even be him. And you don't need to know anymore about that. And it breaks my heart. But I know the hope. That my wife is saved. She's with Jesus. My son is saved. If he were to die. He'd be in heaven. My wife now is saved. My daughter is saved. I know where their redemption lies. It lies in Jesus Christ. And whether death or rapture. I know they'll be in heaven. Wherefore, comfort thee with these words. Hear him, ye deaf. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Hearing, deaf can't hear. But that's not talking about people who are, are truly deaf. I have preached at a farmer's market for four years now. And four years there are people there who have been there for, for most of them years. And they hear me. And they don't hear me. He said, what do you mean? I start off every farmer's market meeting with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, whatever that gets me going for preaching, that builds up a foundation for those that are lost, and people want to hear about the love of God, and when my family comes, my, my wife and my daughter, my wife has a chair. She needs to sit. And she has a sign. She sits there and holds. My daughter has tracks. So, so there, we're walking up there. And she, my daughter's getting her tracks ready. And my wife's getting her seat ready and her sign. Me, I have to put the camera up. I've got to focus the camera, get a picture. And then, you know, i got to set up my chair and water. And I just open up my Bible. i got to find John 3.16. And we've had many times when we're going there, we're in the process of setting up, and there'll be people from that farmer's market that say, oh, for God so loved the world. Now, they heard what I said, but they had not with their ears have adapted to their heart. 
And they can quote and know what I'm going to say, but they are deaf. A willingness to be deaf to God. So again, this is to hear him ye deaf. This is not somebody who is physically unable to hear. These are people who don't want to hear. Hear him ye deaf, ye voiceless ones. Your loosened tongue employ. There are people out there who speak all kinds of words. And the Bible says you, you shall give an account of every idle word. But there are people out there, like I said, in the farmer's market. They speak words but they're not speaking the words of Christ. They're not speaking words of the Bible. And though they may mock what I say of the Bible, they may get up and say, for God so loved the world, like, and they're mocking. That's not a tongue that's crying out to salvation. As much as you were to take this hymn in a church building where there are lost people and they sing along, but they don't mean it. They're not hearing what the hymn is speaking. And some people, oh, we sing the greatest hymns. They're going to get right. All right, come on up to the altar, number one call. Come up to the altar, number 14,000 call. Come up to the altar, number 3,026. We're going to get them up there. That's not salvation. God wants a cheerful giver. And there are many Christians who pick up the hymn book like this wonderful hymn. And they'll... Uh, I do that for songs that are not scriptural. But man, when that white one comes up, man, I'm glory, glorifying God. Hear ye, ye deaf, ye voiceless ones. Your loosened tongues and put Loosened tongues, well, for a thousand tongues. Open up your mouth to what your language is to God to be saved. Call upon Jesus Christ to be saved. I guarantee. My brain just went blank. I hate that. Cornelius did not have the same language as that Ethio Ethiopian eunuch. As much as that Ethiopian eunuch did not have the same language as that uh, guard in the prison in Acts 16. There's no, I'm sorry, I never heard this much. There's no barrier of salvation because you speak this language. Someone comes to you with the feet of the gospel, whatever your language is, and you get saved and proclaimed by God what your language to God, you're saved. And loose that tongue for God. He blind, behold your Savior come. Again, we go back to, to that farmer's market. They see us. They know. We have people tell us, you know, you're faithful to this. We, you're sick and tired of this message you preach. The same message. You got the same signs. And yet you won't turn to God. And leap, ye lame, for joy. Now, verse 6 is wonderful because verse 6 is the story of Jesus. I don't know if you know this. Hear he me, you deaf. All right, let's take it physical. Are you deaf? You can't hear? You can't hear. Are you dumb, which the Bible means you can't speak? Dumb in the Bible means you're unable to speak. If you're unable to speak, go ahead and say something. Blind. See your Savior. Fanny Crosby was blind ever since a little girl. And you know that woman has more insight of Jesus Christ than I do with eyeballs that can see the words. And again you say, where's Jesus? Didn't Jesus tell a man that had a crippled hand, stretch out that hand? That was impossible. And yet God can do the impossible in our lives. When Jesus said, stretch out that hand, he couldn't. When a man who was crippled, he says, stand up. You can't. And yet God can. What a wonderful hymn. I mean, this hymn, sing it amongst Christians and mean it and love the Lord. You don't want to hear me sing. Glory to God. <laughs> and when you got worldly members in the church and, and, and oh go football team oh go football team oh they're going to get a tony no glory to god and peace uh, and praise excuse me 
Praise God, glory to God, and love be now and ever given by saints. If you are not saved, you are not a saint. So thank you, Charles Wesley. You have put in your hymn who are to sing this song, give God the praise. And if you are not saved, when you're doing your beads or you're doing whatever your religion cries you out to do, of a small G-O-D, you're not worshiping the big G-O-D. By saints below, here we are on this miserable, rotten planet. Death, hospitals, fire, famine. Praise God. And everything gives thanks. Rejoice evermore, the Bible says. Below and saints above. What are the saints doing? Those who are absent from the body and presence of the Lord. They're glorifying God and Jesus Christ and the Lamb. The four and twenty-four elders are falling down before the throne, casting their, th their crowns. The four beasts are holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. That's going on right now. And those that we know who are saved and love the Lord are, are in heaven with the angels praising God. And those that are still here, we're waiting. Our blessed hope, our glorious appearing of God, Jesus Christ. So we one day, either by death, absent from the body, whether by rapture, one day we can join that heavenly chorus. That heavenly worship with the angels, with the cherubim, with the four and twenty-four elders, all praising God and nothing else but God and his son. The church in earth and in heaven. The church. It's not sticks and bones. <laughs> oh, bones. It's not sticks and stones. It's not brick and mortar. It is the bride of Jesus Christ, of men and women from the time of Jesus' resurrection to the rapture who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's life. A wonderful, great, I say top. And me, I'm more to the, the marching hymns, but this is one of the great ones. But we got to mind who's going to who's gonna sing it, who's, who's going to, are their heart really into it? But those who are, praise and honor to God. 